Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Lean In session. As always, I'm Michael Linky, and I'm the General Manager of Membership here at the Australian Institute of Architects. Great to have you to uh, spend some time with me today, and a warm welcome to all of you again, and especially our frequent leaners who join us without fail every week. A really exciting Lean In today, something a little bit different and highly technical. In this Lean In today, we've got Steve Brand from Oracle Construction and Engineering, and he's going to be with us to discuss the evolution of construction technology and the fundamental concept of neutrality, a key to establishing a trust foundation, which is capable of feeling true collaboration, which provides universal fairness to project collaboration platforms. So Steve, we've had a couple of conversations. You'll love him, I know. He's an engineer with a 35 year career spanning manufacturing, production engineering, building architect and infrastructure. Um, and he's a senior director at Oracle, one of our partners that we work with here at the Institute. And he's involved in operational inter integration, sales and product strategy, uh, and a lot of customer advocacy as well. So asset owners and project leaders rely on Oracle construction and engineering software for the visibility and control for the supply connected chains and also data security needed to drive performance and mitigate risk across their processes and projects. Customers can feel very confident in their digital transformation with modern cloud solutions that grow and scale with you at every step of your build journey. And so Oracle helps our clients or helps clients enable efficiency, improves collaboration and changes control for teams that plan and build and operate critical assets. Don't forget, as always, the chat box is your friend. So if you have any questions for Steve, please add them to the chat box. And then I'll go through these questions with Steve, time permitting, at the end of his presentation. So without further ado, Steve Brown of Oracle, welcome to today's Lean In. How are you? Thank you, Mark. Very well, thank you. And uh, thanks to uh, your members for allowing me to, um, to join them today. Very nice of you. I'll um, press on, if that's okay. So um, first of all, um, thank you for the introduction, Michael, and I uh, appreciate that. Now, um, uh, as a vendor, um, I want you to know that whilst um, I would like to have an impact on your thinking about one or two things today, um, I have no desire to sell anything to uh, our members here. And so everyone can relax. There'll be no assistant grabbing you in the lobby on the way out the door and, and, and asking uh, for a time when you and your partner will both be at home. Um, that said, I do need to say that these are my views um, and ask uh, you not to make a buying decision based on anything I mentioned about our future product plans. Um, they're the rules of the game at Oracle. Um, my presentation uh, comes in two parts. So this one today and another one in maybe a month's time. We haven't actually fixed a date for that yet. So today I'm going to kind of indulge myself in a way, taking you through my journey in um, manufacturing, production, engineering, building and construction technologies and into um, project controls, collaboration and uh, remote working. Um, in the next presentation, I will lean into uh, model management, um, model coordination into common data environments and try and provide a more holistic view of the digital twin and what it means for us in this industry and society at large. So I pause for a second and life's good. The moderator hasn't pulled the connection so far, so I'll press on. So um, I studied engineering in the UK in the late 70s, um, manufacturing engineering that is, in a company called Textron, which was a US company in their industrial division. Um, manufacturing engineering hadn't changed much since the war years, to be honest. Um, and, uh, uh, but high-speed machine tools could produce repetitive machine parts in a few seconds in those days. Um, and uh, it, it was slightly more challenging to make unique parts, so individual unique parts. They were created using slow but highly flexible machines that could be sort of adjusted to any attitude to achieve the cut required. Um, now, moving into automation, uh, making multiple copies of um, short runs of um, complex parts was always a, a challenge, very high cost. And the emerging technology at the time, or the cutting edge technology, I should say, was hydraulically powered um, machines that used a stylus that could sense and follow the surface of an existing part and using a matching shaped cutter, machine a block of the material to match. And this was a great idea. 
Um, but as I said, it used hydraulics. It was shockingly expensive and incredibly temperamental. Um, so these machines, um, uh, we did install a number of these machines around the UK. Um, they work well as long as our clients had a hydraulics engineer on staff. It was very, very difficult to keep running. And of course, hydraulics were soon replaced with um, powerful electric motors um, that enabled the development of uh, numerically controlled machine tools. And the, the, you know, the first examples involved um, bolt-on drives to existing machines. So moving on, my... Uh, Two, two casts. I don't think I need to go over that again. Um, my uh, early time at Textron, manufacturing technology in the 70s with high-speed machines. Um, in the, uh, in the, for one-off parts, flexible machine tools, you can see an example of here in the Bridgeport, um, which could machine just about anything at any angle. Hydraulic copying machine that uh, had a, a, a true trace head. You can see there a sensor that could copy very complex three-dimensional shapes and machine them uh, on the other head. Um, and then we got to here, which was the introduction of um, uh, powerful electric motors, which allowed computer-controlled machines. And the first examples, such as this, um, were uh, sort of bolt-on drives to existing machines. And later, this was kind of one of those beefed up versions of the existing machine design to handle the forces that these big motors could, could produce. But something really big happened at that time. Um, it happened to me, it happened to many industries across uh, the world, and it was profound in the UK. Um, and it was um, globalization. Um, and by the time Textron woke up to the fact that the rapid advances in computerization and DC motors and ball screw drives and the like would allow an evolutionary change in machine design, um, the early impacts of, of globalization loomed. And I can tell you machine tool manufacturing in the UK virtually disappeared overnight. Um, uh, it, there was a very vibrant manufacturing industry uh, of uh, uh, machine tools and textile machines and, uh, and all sorts of things, and they collapsed over a period of about three to four years. Um, so at that point, um, I took an opportunity to move to Australia, and I supported uh, Textron's um, export business here until um, the same thing arrived in Australia. So then I enjoyed a long career in production engineering and materials handling where I designed bespoke machinery for the likes of Sunbeam and Slazenger and Fisher and Parkell and the likes utilizing um, pro programmable logic controllers and thick looms of wiring. I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the details of that except to say that um, during that time the IBM PC was released and um, nearly every innovation that I can think of since then can be traced back to the availability of that kind of computing power to the common man. Um, and so uh, I, I don't need to talk more on that now. That can, uh, that can come at another time. Now, um, in 2000, uh, I joined, um, and this is just as the IBM Pentium slipped into retirement, for those of you who can remember that, um, I joined Siemens Building Technologies. Um, and building technology at that point generally referred to building management systems, uh, security and, um, and fire detection. And the Siemens fire safety systems used futuristic tech like um, neural networks and fire pattern recognition algorithms to identify smoke uh, fire smoke over uh, dust or, or other airborne particulates like um, cigarette smoke and steam. Um, and they'd also developed really cool fiber optic cable based sensors for tunnels, you know, traffic tunnels and train tunnels that could detect minute changes in temperature and pinpoint, you know, not, not just the seat of the fire, but other danger zones caused by the air vortices, which um, those, um, those amongst you who work in that area um, are familiar with. And uh, during my five years uh, at Siemens, I worked with architects and engineers and clients and, uh, and constructors. And, you know, I was an early adopter of the internet and I was keeping a, a keen eye on what was going on there. And uh, I learned a lot in that, um, in that phase. Uh, I learned about contracting um, and, um, uh, and that was, uh, that was a, a rude awakening. Um, but during that time, I heard about a new kind of construction technology uh, that was sort of um, coming through. And in 2000, um, oh, I did want to mention that um, building technology at the time was, um, was, was, or construction technology was pretty much um, uh, 
um, design, uh, like structural design um, innovation and um, and innovations in materials, uh, material design. Anyway, um, I, I in 2005, I joined Aconix um, and as employee number 45. Um, and I, I joined a company that was far from over the startup hump. Um, they had offices uh, um, in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Auckland, and London. And so they were stretching themselves a long way to a London office. But that was because uh, they, they picked up some projects with Multiplex and they had a project in the UK um, uh, called Wembley Stadium that was causing them some difficulties and they needed some help to deal with Wembley Stadium. And so Rob, who's the chap on the right, um, relocated to London for a little while um, to help um, help Multiplex get out of um, some trouble there. Um, but, um, you know, to be honest, they only had a handful of customers in Sydney at the time and it was, it was obviously hard going. And the, 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 the reason was, you know, they were at the front of a, of a, of a new cycle of technology changing industry. Um, and you know it was it was uh, it was interesting. Um, I remember being taken to a visit at, um, at the Rhodes uh, site of a large contractor uh, and seeing a project administrator struggling across the site with several large rolls of drawings under each arm, uh, and um, my new colleague um, pointing uh, at that chap and saying, "That's what we're going to fix." Um, so that's quite exciting, um, and. You know, the re thing that motivated Rob and Lee was that um, they felt strongly there was something wrong with the industry. So Rob had uh, worked at Multiplex, so I guess that was his foot in the door to uh, to talk to them. And Lee had they they'd been uni university partners. Uh, Lee had a, a, a post at McKinsey at the time, and you know they really thought there was something wrong with the uh, with the industry. When a standing joke um, was that construction ran in three stages: and design, construct and and then sue and you know cruel as it is it just you know it, 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 there's, there's a lot of truth behind a lot of jokes so back then um nearly all business well all business applications were installed on servers in customer premises and everybody made kind of procurement decisions based on their own specific needs um and with the arrival of the internet um you know it, volumes of information and communication literally exploded um and well, listen people were using tools like email and spreadsheets to do things they were not really equipped to handle and we've all done it and we have to do it um but you know there were there were these were serious matters they're dealing with and um and you know robin lee really saw a problem with that so you know increased use of the wrong tools actually compounds existing problems so you know information sits in silos in each organization um, and not just in in organizations but in different applications within those organizations um, and you know you're constantly chasing um, in, to, to get information um, and you're never sure that you've got the latest just about everything was being tracked in you know spreadsheets which were isolated requiring continuous manual entry and distribution which is error prone and slow and, and data is inaccurate right visibility of the project's poor and there's risk everywhere now you know uh, we, we can't say that that all of this has been solved but there's a you know there's a better way and there's a process that's um that uh, they really you know worked on to try and work on to, to to solve this now people tried to solve it themselves so you know enabled by the internet what what organizations were doing was taking one of their own existing applications in their company and making it accessible to other participants on projects um, and you know there's risk and problems with that and uh, the Aconex company saw that so um, our goal following their idea was you know to, to build an easy to use application that's dedicated to the collaboration needs of the construction industry and, and in Australia of course is design and construct. I mean, we've been doing DNC for for decades here now, um, and whilst it's not super popular in the US, it's gathering pace. And so, you know, we're talking about uh, design um, iteration uh, during construction. It has its special needs, and so they they saw the need for an application that was built for that, and it was hosted in the web for the benefit of everyone. And they established some really important principles on an ethical foundation. Uh, uh, and these are more relevant today than ever. And 
I'll, I will talk to technology and I will talk to Oracle's future direction, but I wanted to, to take some time um, in this opportunity today to talk to you as important community members about the relevance of these principles to you uh, as more and more of what you do moves to the cloud. So um, I'll press on if I may. So first question they asked themselves, um, Liam Robb, is who should pay for this service in the cloud that's for a, you know, for a construction um, project? And they knew that the number one measure of success of their idea would be user adoption. Um, and trying to introduce a new concept and extract a fee from every one of dozens to hundreds of organizations, would you'd have to go and convince each organization of its merits um, and the project to be finished before we got there. So since the bulk of the investment in a project runs from the, you know, the owner through the builder and, and there on out into the community, um, the bulk of the investment in a project, um, you know, sits with the client and the head contractor. And that's where the greatest influence is and the greatest incentive to avoid the third stage of construction, if you will. So they felt that there were two, two organizations that could pay for something like this, the client or the head contractor. And then, you know, to talk to them about who was the priority, um, you know, what, what's our goal here? Is it to increase efficiency of, you know, just, just, um, just one organization in the chain? You know, construction is a collaborative effort by organizations who are not all sitting in the same room. So the goal was to lift the entire community up to a new level of capability to help project teams collaborate remotely um, by everybody having access to the same communication efficiency tools. So critical to adoption was community-wide benefit. And the license model needed to allow for unlimited users because, you know, um, people don't choose who can and can't um, access the tools they use in their business. They, as this was going to be an important tool, they had to have access to it. Um, and of course, it had to allow for unlimited users because construction projects depend on cost forecast ability. Um, you know, an open-ended per seat licensing model made forecasting impossible. You just didn't know how many users you'd need. So by um, doing some early investigation into some of the early projects that Aconex was, um, was engaged on, um, they, they, we and they constructed a fixed project value-based fee as a proxy for user licensing. And that's why you'll hear that um, services like Aconex are project value-based. And it's just a proxy for users, but it means that we take the risk and the, and the clients don't. And it's worked all the way till today. And then who should have access? Okay. So why would anybody use it if they can't trust it? Um, and designers, you know, you want to know that using it means that you don't release your IP in your work freely into the market by using a sharing platform. And everyone will want to know who gets to see their data. You know, is, is, it, is it just go to everybody? Or is it still private, um, confidential to the people I want to share it with? Um, and, um, and people need access at all times so that when a dispute happens, they can resolve those questions about um, what actions were taken and under what instruction, et cetera. So all the contractual communications after all are hosted there. So, you know, it's okay to build your own application. It's okay to host it in your business. It's okay to open up portals to other participants to come and, and, and use it. But, you know, when you're taking on responsibility to, to control access, um, it's just not appropriate for um, it's not, it's not a trusted environment. And so that works only for, you know, in-house systems. So now I mentioned that these principles are more relevant um, today than ever. Um, and there are many more cloud-based collaboration systems on the market now um, uh, all over the world. There are just so many of them and they're popping up all the time. Um, but from what I've seen, they all follow a, he or she who pays has the rights model. And I'll, I'll just demonstrate that through a simple animation. So here's two systems and you don't necessarily know which system is a, a cloud-based product that you're using um, adopts. But in system A, the, in this case, the head contractor is paying for it. And you, um, as an architect or an engineer, um, and, I, and I'm talking about subcontractors there as well, you know, you have access through the head contractor allowing you access. And in system B, 
um, it's kind of what I call matrix as opposed to that kind of hub and spoke model is the head contractor is paying for system B to be provided to all of the participants and they access it directly as well as um, using it to communicate with the others. So if there's a dispute, an argument, um, a falling out of any kind and the head contractor decides to disconnect you from communications, um, then you're no longer talking to the head contractor but you are still on the system in the matrix example, whereas you have been disconnected from the system in the hub and spoke example. And in fact, you have no access to any of the decisions, the instructions you receive that justify the actions that you've taken. Um, you know, basically you're on your own. And as you know, if there's a dispute that goes to um, litigation, um, then, you know, uh, he who has the evidence wins. I mean, you, you, you kind of, you know, you're stuck. So um, in the system B, you know, you will always have access and uh, for a period of time, and then you can say, I'd like to retain access or I'd like to take my data down and, and go. And that uh, period of time is provided irrespective of the attitude of the head contractor. Now, that's how Aconix built it. That was one of the values that Liam Rob um, thought was really important. Um, but the owners, the paying party, doesn't always see it that way, you know. So um, just something to think about. So, and who can see what? Um, so as all these parties join a platform and information gets shared, um, uh, you know, we think that you, since you're using or people are using a platform that's not their own, it's provided and they're told to use it, they need to trust that um, you know, not only that you can't be disconnected, but also you can control who shared the work you've done on the system. You know, I think the, con the principle was each organization has to have their own workspace, their, uh, own their data on it, know that nothing can be amended or deleted after the fact, which is not always the case. Um, and, and they must be able to control their own permissions and staff access. So uh, sounds like I'm selling, but I think these are super important principles. It, it, it takes more to build a system that observes these principles. And I, and I guess my message to you is, these are questions you might want to ask, and I'll, and I'll sum those up at, you know, um, a little further on. Um, and so I said that, that our clients don't always uh, agree with these concepts. You know, I'm paying. I want to be able to control everything and see everything. And um, I've had clients uh, very angry that they, they couldn't see the data that another party has got on their project. And it's, um, it's escalated through our service desk, through the management to me. And I've had to field calls with even um, uh, legal counsels with, um, with uh, companies on a couple of occasions. And we, as principals, as ethical foundations to what you do, you know they provide you guidelines that you can and can't go outside of. And so it's easy to deal with a client who says, I'm probably one of your biggest clients and I'm going to take my business elsewhere unless you do what I want. And when it's an ethical foundation, you can say, I'm sorry, I've got to lose your business, you know, but I can't breach this. Um, and, you know, it, it gave the staff at Aconex a sense that they were building something good. They were doing something good for the industry. And uh, it's amazing what a motivator it was for keeping staff who were not necessarily being paid um, what they could have been paid at a big organization. They, um, you know, we had secondhand furniture in the offices, things like that, because we were still building a company, but it, it, it was really important. So when an, a client throws these things at us, you know, we've got answers to them. It actually puts more risk back on you because you could see something that somebody was doing and you didn't act. You know, we, we can say it's, you've got now the administration burden. You've got to manage all of the, you know, access control for people and you know they're waiting for you to configure something you know you, you know uh, it actually if if all of our part uh, um, colleagues here are at risk of being shut out from the information platform that you've been using you're gonna have to duplicate the processes you're gonna have to keep records in-house and that's so debilitating for you know improving efficiency um, and of course you get poor adoption and as we said that's uh, that's the key that's what we're going for now, there's, there's software that's free um, as well. Um, and uh, as we've heard before, I'm sure you've heard that things that are free um, often mean that the product um, is you 
and your information and your behavior and those patterns feed into the the the, the vendor of these free systems so you know there are principles that have to apply there as well i mean this literally isn't a joke so even on systems where you know it's not free you know somebody else is paying you get access to help with that project and produce your content um but you know the data you've shared becomes part of the knowledge base of the vendor to be mined by them and you know sold back to the industry or sold to anyone who'll pay for it um and i think vendors need to be very clear about their policies um, in these areas and Oracle is very clear. We we won't draw insights and sell them back to the industry. Um, uh, but I'll talk later to what their policy is around that, what they're doing. And look, privacy and security are table stakes. There's there's absolutely um, no compromise at Oracle on on security. I can assure you. And um, they loved our principles of collaboration. They have other principles. Um, as well, uh, I'll quickly mention, for example, I'm sure all of us have felt inclined when we know a particular client behaves in a certain way to put a little bit on the price so that when you go through that really tough negotiation that you know they're going to drag you through, you've got a bit more wiggle room to move so you can come to a price that's tolerable for your business and, and get on with the job. Um, but Oracle has an, a principle that is the absolute maximum that we can charge for our services is the published list price, the published list price. So, you know, it's, an, it's a, a principle we hadn't really thought of at Aconex. We had a, you know, a price and we would negotiate as best uh, we could. Um, but we, we, it's not that we used to inflate it almost never charged more than the price that Lee wanted. Um, I can't remember ever charging more than the price Lee wanted, but it's a pr we didn't have it as a principle and we have it now because it's a good principle. So, um, but anyway, back to security, Oracle is right at the top when it comes to security and they've, they've um, we thought we were pretty tight at IE Connect, but we learnt a lesson at Oracle, unbelievable levels of security at every angle. And I guess the, the for them, the rationale is uh, a hacker might be able to hack a, um, you know, hack into um, Aconex. And despite the fact that, you know, um, Oracle acquired us um, for 1.6 billion Australian dollars, um, look, uh, a hacker, but Aconex wasn't a prize for a hacker, but Oracle absolutely is the best prize you can get out there. And it would be devastating to their share price. So, um, you know, the thing is that as you build out an ecosystem and other applications plug in um how secure is the the overall solution um can you depend on them uh, checking the bona fides of you know other systems so we think that security needs to be at least as good as that of our best customer um in terms of security so you know we can't abrogate that responsibility to uh, to others all of that um gave us five principles of collaboration neutrality and um, um, I'll share these with anybody uh, you may have seen them before but there should be no super user who can see all information um, regardless of access rights on a platform and I have to this day uh, customers demanding that um, access rights to the information should be transparent to the publisher so you as a publisher of intellectual property need to know um, you know who has access to that information who's getting it you intended it to go here but suddenly you found it's everyone's got it is that what you you know what you want so it needs to be clear um transmission shouldn't be amended after the fact you know you need to know you can rely on it so that um you know with email now somebody can open an email and change the content and save it and there's no record we don't like that at all um if we're going to have an auditable um you know record if it's truly neutral to all participants it can't be amended Organizations should be able to communicate privately with each other. Um, I remember a, a head contractor once saying to me, um, I don't want to find out that you're communicating with the engineer. Well, I had a great relationship with the engineer over many projects, and naturally I'm going to communicate with the engineer. And if I don't allow it to happen on the platform, I'll just go and do it by email or by fax or call the, 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 the guy. So, you know, you should allow people to do what's naturally necessary to do their job and organizations can't be cut off without notice. So we've, we've clarified that. So um, 15 years later, um, 
over a million people have participated on thousands of projects on on that uh, on that application and 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 you know we talk about working remotely many have never met face to face and many of you have, have uh, you know com um, participated in projects uh, on aconex and tools like aconex and, and never met face to face um uh, i think uh you know project teams have um coordinated their work from all over the world i don't think remote working is a new experience for us uh, you know we will talk about it being a daily um, behavior remotely working from our, our colleagues but um tools like aconex have allowed that to happen for a long time um cloud you know has enabled projects to continue operating through disasters um you know the floods in brisbane the fires across the country um uh you know earthquakes in and christchurch and you know that's just in our small patch of the world globally we've supported projects um during disasters and aided in the the, the natural you know the, the recovery from them um I think the move to the to the cloud is yeah, relentless. You're experiencing it. Um, and uh, 13 years, um, two years ago, um, Aconex joined Oracle. And it was both concerning for us. You know, it was a very mixed emotion day when I got the call um, from um, Paul Perrett, who's uh, the chief operating officer, um, and said, um, we need to prepare ourselves. This is happening. Um, and what the emotion that went through me was um but we haven't finished yet so we were on a you know mission on a journey and it had come to an end more or less that was a sense that oracle was buying us and wasn't that one of those places where good software goes to die and um and i, w I really wasn't my head wasn't ready for it uh and i had to you know immediately this was a sunday afternoon I immediately get ready to let my um staff and i had around um 55 staff at the time um and uh and, and get them ready to let our key clients know before it was out in the press uh but also it was kind of exciting because i knew that oracle had a lot of tech they invested money in artificial intelligence and machine learning and um uh, all sorts of smart stuff that we didn't have the, the, the you know the funds to get into so um it, it it's true so i'm absolutely delighted that oracle um respected our values and in fact took them on um, in the engineering and construction global business unit of which i'm part and said we want to embody these um, and some of oracle's existing products um, are not necessarily neutral by nature um, but uh, because they started as on-premise applications but oracle are really behind this move and um, and so i'll talk more about that uh, in due course uh, but we have access to some really exciting technology and um, that's what kind of motivates me at the moment. Now, despite all this achievement, construction still lags, as you know. Um, and um, I think back to the manufacturing days and the innovations that were happening then. And I could see the pace of change just in the, the you know, the 10 years in the industry or, or whatever that I could see such profound change. And if they continued at that pace, it's no wonder that we see them so far ahead of us in terms of um, gross value added per hour worked. And, um, and so what's, you know, what's going on? And I think, um, What's what's happened is that we 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 we're kind of still doing the same things, we're just doing them quicker. Um, and so, of course, we've ramped, but we, we, you know, we're, we're really not realising the promise, um, and we're spending time looking into why that is. Um, and one of the things is, I think, um, uh, I think insights from the knowledge that we've amassed um has been found to be difficult to compare um because there's no standards and there was little consistency in the data so um you know it's very hard to compare widgets in one um system to gadgets in another if you don't know that they're the same thing and and i think you've all many of you who have tried to embark on this journey to, to derive insights from your your past experience um have had that same um struggle so Data scientists at Oracle and around the world, uh, many organizations have been adopting, you know, this, this artificial intelligence engines to extract meaning from incompatible data and, and um, provide information to improve forward visibility and make, you know, recommendations and all those things you see listed there on the screen. Um, 
and at the end of the day it's about continuous improvement so if we if we can't get the insights we, we can't really drive the improvements um and you know as i said the the data that um uh that oracle is working with is um uh is is you know we have to we have to simulate data to build applications that can do this uh, and that's what we're building now um but you know our clients will then be able to use these applications to to, to mine and exploit their own data um and you know keeping that available is really important and uh so we call this the construction intelligence cloud oracle and it's a, a reasonably advanced stage um and it's sexy as hell but um uh, I'm not the guy to go right into the detail of that, but you know, there's there's effort being made, and um, we're not alone to try and help people um, um, get the benefits of the data by doing this. So, you know, we talk about you capture uh, you capture data, um, which you then can um, make, extract insights from and, and get transformation and continuous improvement, and that's a good experience. So, you know, that's great. So, you know, you you trusted the system. Um, by trust, we get adoption. By adoption, we get more data captured we get continuous improvement and a good experience means you go back and trust it again and that that virtuous circle is what um is what we're you know we're we're trying to drive now the problem is um you know we're dealing with big data now and that has had profound impacts on the way we we think and the way i think our clients need to think and i think i'm getting tight on time um and this isn't just happening um with oracle's products but it, it's happening everywhere and i i think it's demanding new ways to cope uh, especially with the impossible task of bringing it all back home you know bringing it all back in house so it, it's dawned on me I, it seems absolutely crazy to me that you know just in our space at the end of a project clients and participants will say i want all my data back um, um can i download it off a connect or can i get you to archive it for me and i want to put it in my server and and so you take you know you, you take structured data over the public internet to a folder somewhere whether we do it or you do it um and and put it in a uh, you know in, in your server where no doubt the it department says what do you mean you need four terabytes of space for the project data? You know, we're not giving you four terabytes of space. <laughs> Think again. And, um, and um, I have clients ring me back saying, listen, I've got the data, but my IT department won't, you know, won't store it. Can we, can we leave it on, on Aconex? And, um, and, you know, they've already downloaded by that, at that point. So, um, uh, you know, it, what's going to happen when you tell your, IT department. I've got four terabytes. So I've one terabyte. I've got six projects for two terabytes each. Um, they're going to say put it in our cloud. Okay, so it goes back in whatever preferred cloud um, uh, uh, vendor system you've got, Azure, you know, Amazon, whatever it is. Um, Oracle. It, it gets back uploaded to the cloud, but it's now unstructured data in folders in the cloud, and it's very difficult to mine. So. Uh, I think as the reality of big data finally hits home to people, companies will get used to keeping their data in the cloud service in which it was created um, and maintaining accounts, so, you know, just subscriptions to keep it there. So they'll have multiple ports, places of storage of data and they'll just keep a good record of where it is and they'll get used to sort of pulling it in when they need it, um, which of course you can do with, uh, with Aconex now in case any of you weren't aware, you don't have to take your data off at the end of a project. The project owner will not delete the data and won't get rid of it. So long as you've got a subscription for it, Oracle won't delete it either. And um, it's, uh, it's all in its original form right, with all the tools in place and you can go and dig into all sorts of detail there. So, um, and the analytics tool will be designed to access that data on Aconex. So that's a, a kind of future. And then there's some, um, you know, there's new change that's fallen upon us with, um, you know, design tools that are being used for, uh, you know, BIM-based uh, design and, and model management. You know, we've got a new confusion upon us with um, so many new tools to manage, you know, more, user uh, licensing to get through more silos being built um, with information sitting in so many different places and all these systems have different cloud licensing around them that I'm now cautioning you just to have a look at and understand and you know I think you know we're back to silos and there has to be a way to avoid that um, so uh, more or less in closing um, what I'd like 
to, to, to um, steer to is where I will go with the next um, chance to talk to you all, which is um, kind of the uh, concept of a common data environment and uh, the underpinning ideas around that and what that does for the, the silo situation. Um, and then, you know, how all this fits in with, you know, the digital twins uh, that we're hearing about and what that means. Um, and uh, there's a lot to talk about around that. Um, there's a lot of thinking going on in Oracle. We're working very closely with um, Building Smart and other organizations around the world uh, to establish standards. Uh, that is for the next talk. So I hope you can tune into that. And thanks everybody for sticking with me. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve Brandt of Oracle for that presentation. I've got a few questions and of course, by all means, um, for those of you um, who do have a question, feel free to pop it into the chat box and then I can um, cover this off with Steve. Look, Steve, part of me, I'm getting older, part of me feels like I need to be somewhat of a computer scientist to appreciate and understand the complexities that this system offers. So how confident are you that the average architect who deals with you know, a number of different systems like Revit and, and other design programs, how can an architect, and I'm saying the average architect, can embrace a program like this with ease and be confident enough to sort of facilitate and navigate around the program? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I mean, first of all, uh, to um, the decision to use an application like this is not the architect's decision in most cases, but they are, they can be very influential and they're an important community to, uh, to Oracle. Um, back in the early days of Aconex, I spent a lot of time with architects um, because if they found it just too hard, they would um, reject it outright and the uh, buyer of the platform would then come back to us saying, well, people aren't using it. So adoption is important. Um, there are um, the, the, very often the application that I'm talking about, the collaboration platform is used just to communicate, um, you know, the questions and answers type stuff that normally happens on email and uh, to upload their designs to the platform for distribution to, to others. They have, uh, you know, we have fabulous, most of, most of these vendors uh, like Aconnects have a fabulous uh, service desk, you know, help desk resource really good online resources are crucial to this. And there are training courses that can be done the sort of simple, media, moderate level, and then enhanced level. And for most users, the simple level course is adequate. You know, we talk about collaboration between different sort of building firms and that sort of thing. And, and in the architecture profession, as you well know, we have architects of all different shapes and sizes mm -hmm. collaborating with big development firms on, on major builds and, and, you know, the whole real gamut of, of a build experience. Um, and Kent Lyon, he's a member of ours. He's based in Bunbury, south of Perth in Western Australia. He had put a comment on, and this is an interesting one. He, he found Aconex great during construction. Fantastic. But once the WA government, um, the owner of that project closed that project down, yes. Kent was told that he had then had to pay for the provision of a project archive. Now that was fine for the government. They've got endless pots of money, yes. but for a small practice, it's, it's quite prohibitive. How do you yes. ensure affordability for architects who are in the smaller uh, site, you know, sole trade architects who may not have the capital to afford access to such things? Yeah. Um, and that's, um, it's a really good question. The, uh, I think that the online, um, archive option uh, is um, is uh, the way of the future. I think the idea of taking the data off and storing it locally will eventually just have to die because we, we, we won't have the storage capacity for it. And uh, as time goes on, and I'm as responsible for this as anybody, um, the, the pricing of subscriptions to store data online has to reflect um, you know, the affordability of the participants. Um, and I, you know, I really appreciate that question coming from, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, Cox Architects or, you know, Woods Bagot might have more funds to, to manage these kind of things. But the smaller practices, I appreciate it's quite an impost. Um, and I'll take that on notice that uh, I, I need to look at the pricing strategy as we fold into, we're still on Aconex pricing as we fold into Oracle. And I'll look at their subscription programs that they have for you know, data storage uh, across their business. And I'll see what I can take forward with that. So I'll make a note of that.
Yeah, that'd be great, Steve. Thank you. Because, you know, as a, as a peak body for architects, we um, are driven by our passion, obviously, for supporting the profession, but also to make sure that, you know, that smaller architects aren't prohibited from accessing projects because they don't have the capital to actually get the tools to get the job yes. done. So thanks for looking into that. And maybe next time when you come back in a month or so to do your sure. BIM presentation, maybe you can give us an update on some pricing sure. and subscription strategies that will suit our members who are in remote and regional areas and those that um, operate a smaller practice. Um, a, a question um, from, uh, from me, I suppose, working with architects day in, day out, by nature, they are fantastic project owners. They are very much, um, I love working with them because they have this very strong need to see the full end to end of projects. And when you were talking, you, you talked about, you know, super owners don't get access to everything. Doesn't this go against the mindset of, of architects who by nature like to have control from, you know, the very end of the spectrum to the other end? And, and won't some of those concepts of not being able to access every piece of information turn architects off before they've had a chance to experience the collaborative platform? Hmm. I, th I suppose if uh, you have control of, you know, you're the person that has that visibility and that control, um, you, uh, you get used to it and you, you know, it's kind of a, you feel comfortable having that, um, that control. If you're not, it's a little less comfortable. And I guess it was the same for uh, head contractors who said, look, I'm paying and I want control of everything. Um, what we're asking organizations to do is think about what they can do today, you know, and they've always been able to do over time, which is, you know, you have your own business, you have your own filing cabinets, you know what you've got, and you know what you've sent to others. Um, and realistically, what we're, what we're saying is if you try and break that so that there's one central pool, just a dumping ground of everything and everybody can see, or maybe you're the only one who can see what everything that's in the dumping ground, um, you're asking people to open the kimono, basically. You're asking them to show you what they're doing between their private consultants and themselves, um, and, and they won't join the party. You know, literally, you'll, 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 throw a party and you'll be the only person with a table full of booze um and so you know what we've got to do is find that middle ground where all the other participants in the community will trust an environment to come and then use the efficiency tools across the whole community that it can provide not not make something so open and exposed that they say hell i'm not going there and so yes that the ability of an architect to project manage to know you know, um, that the, who's got the designs, what version of the designs they've got, what's happening. Those tools are you know, built into the distribution um, tools on the platform so that when a new, you know, for example, an architect needs to create a new version, create a new version, create a new version, and then issue a revision and distribute. One of the problems with just totally open platforms is every new version you create is available to everybody and it may not have tagged it as for construction but they see it and might start doing something with it oh there's a new version we better use that one and uh, so you lose control with the with the completely open systems and i know there's shades of open um but but uh, we felt that absolutely the best way was to keep organizations um private and then can rapidly and easily distribute Yep, sounds good. Um, a, a question from Ian, uh, and this is this is an interesting question. He, he, Ian asks, look, how do you address often conflicting contractual DNA between a, a specific project's largely traditional, I suppose, contractual arrangements and the utopia of general collaboration? Um, you can't. Uh, that's absolutely our point. Mm. Um, you know, the... the contractual relationships if you like they're a, a rough stone worn smooth through the tides of time um and as much as you know in my retirement i'd like to take hold of a standard you know um consulting agreement and rip it to bits and make it a little bit more fair for um for our, our colleagues here um uh the reality is that the contract is the contract you can't work outside of the contract and so the platform you're using absolutely has to sustain that so i clearly haven't made the point that i wanted to make is that what i've described 
is what's pretty much written into most contracts is I will have an expectation of you and you will deliver on that expectation um, and then you can make your you know, expectations of others downstream. And, and so the system needs to support those contractual relationships and not try and bro- break them or breach them because technology allows it. Steve Brand of Oracle, thank you very much for the presentation that you've given to us today and the amount of effort uh, you've put into the presentation. It's been um, quite an interesting and um, elaborate uh, sort of introduction to the world of Oracle for me. And um, I'm sure that many people will be wanting to um, watch the presentation again. So I do want to uh, remind all of you watching that you can definitely download a copy of uh, today's presentation again on our dedicated COVID-19 webpage as well. So Steve Brand of Oracle, thank you very much. That's it for today's Lean In. As always, I've been Michael Linke. I've been the host uh, for today's session. Thanks very much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, next week.